Wanted by the presence of each and every one of you this evening, and I encourage you to be taking up your Bibles and following along with me. Uh, to test the things I have to say, to see that it be by the Word of God. I hope that we'll find it to be the truth that we'll take and apply in everyday walks of life, that we can leave here being better servants of God in the future than we have in the past. This morning, we began a two part discussion on roots. A two part discussion on uh, roots. Hey, Rodney, would you? Yeah. Could you take the 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 camera? I mean, the the computer next to the camera and run it up to the top and click at the top, please. It'll tell you on the board in a minute. We're in the middle of a two part discussion on roots. Let's see here. The camera. It'll appear in the top right corner. Uh, on the screen, you just run it all the way off the screen and it'll it'll pop up on the top. You just run it up and click on the keyboard uh, or the uh, click on the mouse. So we're in the middle of a two part discussion on uh, roots uh, that we began this morning where we talked about some what we refer to as improper roots, uh, because there are some things that we uh, as uh, Christians, we as individuals become rooted in some things that we become uh, set in, some things that the way we live our life springs forth from, like a plant springs forth from the soil, and uh, those things are improper. Those things are the kinds of things that God uh, would not have us uh, to be part of. And so... Uh, we talked this morning about our feelings being an improper root. Sometimes we become rooted in how we feel about something. Uh, we become rooted in... Uh, hey, Rodney, if, you take it, if you'll just click on the mouse right there, it should start working. Take the mouse up just slightly higher, please. I saw it pop up on the screen two seconds ago up on the back TV. There we go. Thank you. We talked this morning about how uh, our roots have become an improper feeling or we have a root of improper feelings sometimes or an improper root of feelings. We we say, well, this is how I feel things ought to be. This is what I think things ought to be. We just want somebody to sort of pat us on the back and say that the way we're living is OK in the eyes of God. And if and we just keep doing what we're doing. Then we talked about the root of bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15 mentioned the root of bitterness. And sometimes we become rooted in bitterness and rooted in the improper attitudes. We, we, we become set in these attitudes that are contrary to what God would have us to be. And so what results in our life is maybe things like divisions, because we may have, particularly when two parties are rooted in, in bitterness. Things that may come, uh, come about as we uh, live our life that, that we may have a problem of envy because we're bitter towards somebody else. And now what that causes is some improper attitudes in our relationships. We said that sometimes we're rooted in what is popular. Because everybody else is doing it, we seemingly justify it. And so we dress like the world dresses. We talk like the world talks. We watch what the world watches. We participate in what the world participates in. And sometimes you can tell no distinction between a Christian and a person of the world because we say everybody else is doing it. And so we root ourselves in what's popular. And then sometimes we root ourselves in materialism. First Timothy chapter six and in verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of, of evil. Well, this evening we want to discuss uh, the proper Roots. What are the proper roots that you and I are to have in our everyday walks of life? And so this morning we saw what we can't be rooted in. This evening we want to talk about what we should be rooted in. We're going to begin in what should be rather obvious. We uh, referenced a couple of these already this, uh, this morning when we talked about some roots. And so at least the first two will be rather obvious that these are necessary roots. But if we're going to have the kind of, if we're going to be the kind of plant, going back to our illustration this morning, the kind of plant we need to be, we need to be the kind of plant whose roots are planted in a root or uh, in faith. 
We need to be those rooted in faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 6. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. We want to be the kind of people we need to be. We want to be a, a, a tree firmly planted like the psalm, uh, psalm one, the psalm describes in Psalm 1. We need to be rooted in faith. Being rooted in faith means that we're rooted in our belief in God. If we want to be pleasing to Him, we must believe that He is. Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 6. Now, uh, this faith, as we'll see more in a moment, is, more th- is not just a belief itself. This is an act of obedient faith. And we'll see more about that in a second. Uh, But it begins with believing that God is. Believing that He exists. Believing He rewards those who diligently seek after Him. And so, we need to have a faith in God. Deeply rooted in the belief in God. But not just in God, the Father, but a, a, a faith deeply rooted in Christ and our belief in Him. Again, our passage in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's not just belief in the Father, but belief in the Son. In fact, there were some who denied Christ, yet believed in the Father. Now, they obviously were not following the Father's will, but there are those, as you go through the New Testament, who believe in God the Father, who who did not believe in Jesus. And he said those that didn't believe in him would perish. And so we need to believe not only in the Father, we need to believe in the Son. But not only believe in Christ, we need to believe Christ is dead. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, love and the duration of spiritual gifts. And as we talked about 1 Corinthians 13, we pointed out that the outline of the book, that it's four sections. Problems Paul learned by the court. Uh, questions the Corinthians had asked. And then chapter 15 was a section by itself. The problem of false teaching on the resurrection. There are some that are denying that we will be raised. If they deny we're raised, Paul points out here in the text, we'll see in a moment, they deny Christ is raised. And if Christ is not raised, our faith is futile. Look beginning at verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I declare you, as of first importance, what I also received, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he gives evidence of those he appeared to. But he says it was important in the teaching that they learn about the sacrifice of Christ. We remember that every first day of the week. They were they were aware of the burial of Christ, and then that not only that he was buried, but he was raised out of that grave on the third day. He delivered that to them of first importance. Skip on down in the text down to verse 12. Verse 12 beginning. Now Christ just proclaimed his race from the dead. How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be, uh, are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. And so the point here in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is uh, of the importance of the resurrection of Christ. Without it, he said, your faith is futile. And when he was telling them what they needed to know, they didn't just need to know about Christ and his sacrifice. They didn't know about him being raised from the dead. And so we need to believe and have faith in the fact that Christ was raised from the dead. In fact, that's what proves him to be the Son of God. It was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness By His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 1 and in verse 4. And so we want to have the kind of faith we need. We don't need to be rooted in those things we saw this morning, but instead we must be rooted in faith. 
If we're going to be pleasing to God, we've got to be rooted deeply in faith, our belief in Him. As we said this morning, that, that, that the roots are the, the origin of something. Right? The, the roots are the origin of something. So as we saw this morning, if you're rooted in material, you're going to live a material life. If you're rooted in bitterness, you're going to have a bitter attitude towards individuals. If you're uh, rooted in your feelings, you're going to live whatever you feel instead of what you read. Right? If, you, if you're rooted in what's popular, you're going to do what everybody else is doing instead of what the Scriptures read. Because that's the origin or the source of what we do is where those roots are. If we're rooted in faith, we're going to live a life pleasing to God because of that faith we have in Him. That faith, that without which it is impossible to please Him. And so if we want to have the kind of roots that we need in our everyday life, we want to be firmly rooted, we've got to be rooted in our faith in God and in Christ. But not only are we to be rooted in faith, we need to be rooted in God's Word. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's Word provides all that we need. That's the point, one of the points being made here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. As Paul's writing to Timothy, and consider the context of 2 Timothy 3. Turn there with me if you don't already have your Bibles open there. And consider the context, backing all the way up. And we're not going to read through all this for time's sake, but backing all the way up into verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And so Paul describes this time of difficulty or, or perilous times that's going to take place. And so here all these things are going to happen. Where you've got people that are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, and you can go on down through the list. Paul says this is what these kind of people are. But instead, Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Verses 10 and 11. And so Paul says, these difficult days are coming, which by the way are not just persecutions, but living in the midst of these immoral people as part of that difficult days that he described first, and dealing with those who would be false teachers. And then he says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Verse 12. He says, Timothy, these difficult days are coming. You've already seen me undergo difficulties. Remember, this is 2 Timothy. In chapter 4, Paul's going to say, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul's already faced some very difficult times, and his life is about to end. And he told Timothy that all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. He said that these people these, that he's described before, these terrible, uh, wicked individuals, that these evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. Deceiving and being deceived, verse 13. You think it's bad now? He says they're going from bad to worse. But as for you, verse 14, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The point Paul is making here to Timothy is not, Timothy, you know the Scriptures, and you know the Scriptures are inspired by God. He, he, he says that, but there's a, there's a point behind it, and that is, Timothy, you're in the midst of difficult times. Times are only going to get harder. But in the midst of all that, remember this. You have a faith firmly rooted in the Word of God. Remember what you learned from childhood and how you've known the sacred writings able to make you wise. Remember the fact that it makes you complete. Or some translations would say, thoroughly Furnished. You're completed by that. Again, if it's complete, that's everything we need. 
There's nothing else that we need if it it makes us complete. And it equips us for every good work, which means there's nothing we need to do that this right here does not equip us for. And Paul points out to Timothy, Timothy, you've got a faith rooted in the Word of God. Remember that. Remember how your faith is rooted in God's Word as you view that as most important in your life. But not only do we need to be rooted in God's Word because it provides all we need, we need to be rooted in God's Word because it's the standard by which we're going to be judged. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. John 12 and in verse 48. Jesus says that the word that he has spoken will judge us in the last day. So we can live however we want to live on this, on this earth. But in the end, this is the standard by which we're going to be judged. Have we lived in accordance with what the scriptures teach? Well, if we're firmly rooted in God's word then this is going to be what we're going to live out in our everyday lives. But if we're not firmly rooted in the Word of God, and instead rooted in some of those other things we saw this morning, or maybe something other than that of a worldly nature, then we're not going to have the kind of faith pleasing to God. We need to be rooted in the Word of God because it provides everything we need. Because it's the standard by which we're going to be judged. And because keeping God's Word is what is required of us. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, verse 13 as well, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. What does He require of us? He requires us to keep His commandments. Not only does He require we keep His commandments, but consider the fact that the commandments is the whole of man. Keeping God's fearing God and keeping His commandments is the whole of man. Uh, We talked about this some on Wednesday evening in our invitation. On Wednesday evening, mostly about the fear aspect, but uh, the point is made in Ecclesiastes 12 that the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Uh, uh, You heard me say before... I think Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon near the end of his life. That seems to be the indication. That maybe Ecclesiastes is Solomon as he's at the very end, maybe finally having a change of heart from some of the things that took place in 1 Kings. But either way, Solomon's point is, and this is why I think it's written at the end of Solomon's life, if I tried everything to make myself happy on this earth. He says, I've tried wine. Again, not drinking alcoholic wine, but trying things of pleasure. I've tried women. You think about all the women he was married to, all the concubines he had. He's tried earthly wisdom. And so here's this man, a very wise man from an earthly standpoint. He tried work. If Solomon wanted a building to be built, he had it built. He tried all sorts of work to keep himself happy. He built great things. He had wealth. Silver was as common as rocks in Israel. In the days of Solomon. And yet the conclusion he reached is vanity of vanity. All is vanity. But then when he came to the end, he said the conclusion. All has been heard. All the evidence has been presented. You can imagine it like a court case. All the evidence has been presented. Exhibit A, B, C. And he goes on down the list. And when all the evidence points to is this. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's what makes you whole. Solomon felt like part of him was missing. And the solution wasn't wealth or wine or women or work or wisdom. The solution was to fear God and to keep God's commandments. That's what makes man whole. As I said before, the word duty there in verse 14, or verse 13 rather, is added by translators. It's better translated, this is the whole of man, or this makes man whole. So it's not only what the Lord requires of us, it makes us whole to keep His commandments, and it's how we're acceptable to Him. We call this passage on Wednesday evening in Bible class, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. 
It's a parallel statement, very similar to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It's keeping God's commandments. That's what's right. That's what we're required to do. And so we want to be firmly rooted in... Uh, in, in we want to have the right kind of roots. We've got to be rooted in God's Word. Uh, not just reading it, not just hearing it, but living it in our everyday walks of life. If you want to be pleasing to God, you've got to be rooted in His Word. And there's two ways in which that exemplifies itself. Number one, as we already said, living it out. If we're somebody truthfully rooted in the Word of God, we're going to be living God's Word out in our everyday life. Uh, we said this morning, uh, as we talked about roots, and we, we used the illustration of being sick as well, that sometimes what we see are, are symptoms of a greater problem. And so, you know, if you have a body aches, it's a sign that you probably have a fever. And if you have a fever, that means you probably got some kind of virus or cold or flu or something. Uh, we trace it on back. And so the same thing we said with our bad roots this morning. You see some divisions. Well, it may be because there's bitterness under the surface. You see somebody missing services for recreational activities, but that's because something over here is more important to him. You see somebody dressing like the world does, that's because of popularity. Well, sometimes we need to understand the opposite of that can be true, and that is sometimes we see something in people's lives, and what we've got to realize is it's not the what's being exemplified in their life is the fact that they're firmly rooted in the Word of God, and they're living that out in their everyday walks of life. And so we ought to be, we said this morning, we shouldn't be like the world, Instead, we ought to be that holy, set apart, different people where people look at us and say, something's different about them. They may not know right off the bat that it's that we believe in God's Word and that we're trying to live by this, but they can see that something's different. And just like when somebody's sick, we sort of trace it back to the source. You've got a body ache, now you've got a fever, here's why you've got a fever. If somebody looks at us closely and they say, this person's different. They talk different. They dress different. They don't even watch the same kinds of things that we're watching filled with all these, these immoral things. And then they begin to talk to you. They're going to begin to realize they're different in the way they live their life and not doing these things because they're firmly rooted in the Word of God. And so we need to be rooted in God's Word, living it out in our everyday walks of life, but not only living it out, we need to be, when we're firmly rooted in God's Word, we're going to be teaching it to others. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so we ought to be teaching others God's Word. If we're firmly rooted in the Word of God, we're going to want to share that with others. Just like those we've seen in the book of Acts, who even in the midst of persecutions went about teaching the Word of God. So we need to be firmly planted or firmly rooted and never wavering in our need for God's Word. Some proper roots. Well, proper roots are rooted in faith. A proper root is being rooted in God's Word. A proper root is being rooted in our need for authority for everything that we do. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 17. Colossians chapter 3 and in verse number 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We need to be rooted in the fact that we need authority for all that we do. As we already saw in Colossians 3.17, we do all in the name of the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 11, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. And then according to 1 Corinthians 4.6, we cannot go beyond what is written. In this case, in 1 Corinthians 4, he's talking about how they view the preachers. But uh, even in that standpoint, as he makes this statement, it applies to everything that we do. That you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. We need to understand there's a need for Bible authority for everything that we do. Uh, the Scriptures point that out. Long before it was ever said by anybody else to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible was silent, God's Word said it in 1 Peter chapter 4. It said it in 1 Corinthians 4. It said it in Colossians 3. You need authority for everything you do. And so if we want to be the kind of people we need to be, we need to be rooted in authority or the need for authority. If we're not rooted in the need for Bible authority for the things that we do, then we're going to begin participating in things in our life that's not permitted in the Scriptures and living the kind of life that's contrary to what the Bible tells us to do. 
Bible says, here's what you need to do. We're going to be found over here doing something else. Not if we're, if, if we're not rooted in authority. Because if, if, we're, if we're rooted in authority, then we're going to stay within the confines of God's Word. But then we'll begin to go outside and do things contrary to God's will if we don't think we need to, the authority for what we do. And then the church will begin to participate in works not authorized because if none of us are rooted in authority, then before you know it, we can change anything and everything to fit what we think is more entertaining than what is found within the confines of God's Word. You see, we need to be rooted in the need for Bible authority. Rooted in the fact that we need book, chapter, and verse for everything that we do. You, know, the, uh, you may be criticized by those of the religious world. Uh, by those who talk about you needing a book, chapter, and verse for everything you do. Or you talk about your need for command, example, and necessary inference. And you know they make the acronym CENI. And they talk about these people that, that, that are going, living by that. Listen, it may be meant as an insult. But if somebody says that you're one of those people, that means you're somebody that believes in the need for Bible authority, just as God's Word has said. And we need to be rooted in the fact that we need authority. Rooted in the fact that when something comes up, the question we ought to be asking is, where's the authority for that? Do we have authority for it? If we do, go ahead. If we don't, we can't. You see, the problems in the religious world would be solved if we were all. Not just those of us here, those in, in churches all around the country, those in religious bodies, even those outside the body of Christ. If they all came, we all came to realize the need for authority and be rooted in the fact that we need book, chapter, and verse for everything that we do. We would solve a whole lot of problems in this world, a whole lot of divisions, a whole lot of questions. If we get back to the fact that we need to come back to God's word as the standard and search for authority for everything we do. And so we need to understand that we've got to be rooted, firmly rooted, in the need for authority. Not just rooted, firmly rooted. We don't want weak roots that when something comes along, we change our position, but firmly rooted that we need Bible authority for everything we do. We need to have the proper root. Proper roots are being rooted in faith, rooted in God's Word, rooted in the need for authority, and finally, rooted in the assurance of heaven. Are your roots firmly planted in the fact that you have a home in heaven if you're pleasing to God? Because if you have your goal fixed there and you're rooted in the fact that you can have a reward, then it'll help you focus more in your service to God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 with me. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. We need to be rooted in the fact that we can have the assurance of heaven when our life on earth is over. It's a promise, a promise God will keep. In Titus chapter 1 and in verse 2, Paul said, In hope of eternal life, that's your home in heaven. Eternal life, which God, who never lies, or other translations say, who cannot lie. Promise before the ages began. We have a promise and a hope of eternal life. Uh, you've heard the word hope before. It's a desire plus expectation. And we have that hope. Not because some man promised it to us. Not because somebody we cannot trust promised it. But God, who cannot lie, promised it before the ages began. He promised us a home in heaven if we serve Him faithfully to the end. And we can be assured of that. That if we live our life faithfully, we will have that home. Why? Because God said so. That home that according to Revelation 21 is described as a city of gold. I think the language is figurative as the rest of the book is. I don't think our minds could comprehend how beautiful heaven really will be. But in the best way to describe it, the human mind, it's described as a city of gold. A place where the gates all have different stones. 
I tell you, the description of Revelation is 21 is beautiful. Yet I think it pales in comparison to what heaven will really be like. And we can be assured that if we serve God faithfully, we can have that home in that beautiful city of gold. In fact, it's the assurance of this reward that led to Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldees. In Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 10, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And he's the one in verse 13, him along with the other patriarchs, that all died in faith, not having received the promises, but seen them and greeted them from afar. They acknowledged they were strangers and exiles on the earth. You say, yeah, they were strangers and exiles. They were living in a land that wasn't their own. They were living in Canaan. They didn't have any land. No, that's not what he's talking about. They were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear they're seeking a homeland. Yeah, they're wanting to find a home. They want to find a place to settle down. That's not what the Hebrew writer is talking about. Because if they had been thinking of, of that land from which they had gone out, that is leaving earth the Chaldees, they would have had opportunity to return. They could have gone back to her and had a house and settled down. Had a plot of land. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. And so we can have that same assurance that Abraham did that led to Abraham being willing to leave Ur of the Chaldees because he knew he had that home in heaven if he served God faithfully. We need to be rooted in the fact that we've got the same assurance. It's not on the board, but look at Hebrews, uh, the 13th uh, chapter. Hebrews chapter 13, and in verse 14. Hebrews 13, and in verse 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Just like Abraham made it plain that he was seeking a homeland, we too can seek for that city. The city which has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We can be firmly rooted in the fact that we have a home in heaven if we're faithful to God. Firmly rooted, never wavering, knowing that as long as I serve God faithfully, I'll have my reward and you'll have yours. We just have to keep His will. We need to have the proper roots. We said this morning there are some improper roots. Feelings, bitterness, popularity, materialism, and we could go on and on of more. And we don't need to be planted in those things because then what results in our life is a life contrary to the will of God. But instead, we need to be properly rooted. Rooted in our faith in God and in Christ. Rooted in God's Word. Rooted in the need for authority. Rooted in our assurance of heaven. And if we're rooted in these... If we're rooted in the fact that we can have that reward, if we're rooted in the fact that we believe in God, the Creator of this world, believe in the fact that He gave His Son, not only that He gave His Son, but His Son uh, had risen from the grave on the third day. The fact that this right here is His Word, and it gives each and everything we need in our life to equip us for every good work and to make us complete. And the fact that we can stay only within the confines of God's Word, that we need authority for everything that we do then we can have that home, that assurance that we talked about this evening. The question we need to ask ourselves as we come to a close is, where are you rooted? Are you rooted in the kind of things that we talked about this morning? The kind of things contrary to God's will? The kind of things not pleasing to God? Because if you are, you need to make a change. If you're not a Christian and you've heard the word of God and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we not repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. Be buried in the waters of baptism. Put your roots in the faith in God and Christ and in His Word. Maybe you're here and you've done that. You say, somewhere along the line, I tore up the roots that I needed to have and I planted some somewhere else. If it's a sin of a private nature, you can take it to the Lord privately in prayer. But if it's a sin of a public nature, you desire the prayer to the congregation, we gladly pray with you and forgive you. No matter what your need is, if you're here this evening and we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward together we stand and as we sing?